Welcome to this fourth video in the series of uh, SEDA, History, Craft and Modern Practice. My name is Annette Hust and the topic uh, for us today is uh, meeting a, a handful of well-known site workers from uh, SAGA and history. Uh, in our first two videos, we met Torbjörg Lillevølve, who did uh, a big community theater, should we say. Uh, well, it was done on behalf of a question, a burning question, or a plea for help from the group. And uh, she did it sitting in, uh, well, it should have been a circle of singers, but at least there was one good singer. And this was done indoor. In video number two, we met the, the experienced, but still, should we say, a searching Völva uh, from the poem Völuspå, uh, that showed us something about how the method of Utisita sitting out on a vision quest can be um, combined with doing sight for yourself, or in this case, for your own uh, diving deeper into your apprenticeship. So today uh, we will meet, well I've handpicked um, some examples of some, some people, some site workers that gives us uh, examples of, of a broader range of both uh, ways that you can do SEDA and purposes that it could be used for. As it is told to us in the sagas. And um, it's so that we both can know more about the method, the craft, and how to work with the intent for divination or healing or changing the, changing the, whether the course of things. Or, um, and also it will, these short stories or these little anecdotes, are, they are more or less, they will give us a lot of good stuff to, uh, to talk about ethics. It, there are some rather juicy examples, I should say. Now, why should we at all hear these old examples? Why not just give, a, should, should I say, a, a practical or an overall instruction in how best to do SAID in this way, in, in a lot of people, that when you're alone, when you're in, when you're out. Um, and that is both because they have a lot of information and stuff for thinking, and also because I think you should know about them, or we should know about them, because a lot of scholars and also some modern site uh, practitioners, they, they lean on these stories or they refer to them. And sometimes, um, especially when it comes to do site for change, they will have uh, other interpretations of the character of site and what's, uh, what's okay to do and what's not okay to do. Yeah, um, my intention is that through these stories and then, then I, do, I go through them and then we'll look at both the, the, the form, the method, the ritual form and what was their mission there, what was their task. And, and together with that, um, I think it should together give you a key or should we say a, a pair of glasses so that um, you can go on and read all kinds of stories about sight and then you have your own way of, should we say, looking at it with two kinds of sight in a way. Um, that you both use like a logic uh, reading and, uh, and also is able to use a shamanic or animistic a view in order to both read between the lines and also be able to discern when is what's happening here the saga's own agenda and when is it actually telling something reliable about how one can do Seder. And uh, 
it's that that's I guess that's in short why I call this magic university because we we both use logic and we also lose magic so we use magic logic that's what I will go on with now to the stories there is I think I'll start with um, a rather intense story or a couple of of uh, of, of records of of um, of two powerful sailors that was done by a family together. They worked as a unit. Um, uh, Kotkel, Grima, and their two grown sons. I think they were called Harald Jön or Stigandi. I think yeah. They had. When this um, story takes place in Laxdola saga, uh, and uh, the family had recently uh, come, uh, uh, immigrated from the Hebrides, and uh, rather soon after that, they get quite a reputation, both um, both because they are. Um, Maced sidemen. They, they were they were great side workers and uh, and wise and magic. I don't quite remember what the expression was used. Maybe we could put them down in the notes um, under the video. And they also get a reputation for being tough neighbors. There were neighbors said that, uh, they were stealing. And uh, especially one uh, older woman, she complains to her son, and then he um, s he sails over to them to where they live and uh, is gonna summon them to the Alting uh, to accuse them of theft and uh, she would say ill willing uh, magic sorcery. And then when he's done that. He's probably also called Thorbjorn, but I've forgotten. Uh, then he's, he goes um, he, he goes home again, sailing, goes out on his boat, uh, wanting to return home. But then the family, because now it's turned into a dispute, a conflict, full blown. Then they built a great site here, outdoors, and all the four of them climb up on there. And they do a powerful seder that's directed at their enemy, who is now out on his in in his boat on the sea. And part of this um, in this site, they used um, galders, and it's said that these galders they were hard spun, meaning unbreakable. And they result in a storm being raised, and uh, the ship sinks and everybody drowns. That was like the first we hear about them. And the next thing that happens is that um, they are then forced to move to another area of the country, and uh, their landlord uh, there, he has gotten himself an, an enemy another enemy, yeah, that he wants to humiliate. So he, the landlord, hires his tenants, this family Kotkel Grima and their two sons, to with the task of humiliating uh, Hut, he's called. And they do that by, you know, there could have been many other ways they could have done that. They could have uh, lured him into an ambush and uh, castrated him, or or other things. But in this case, they chose instead to at Hut's house when everybody had gone to sleep that uh, one night. They went there, and either they built another side hill right outside their house. Uh, in some versions hear that they simply sat on the roof of the house and then they started their side songs. So we know already now that they they could achieve their uh, their aims 
And the thing is that even this side leti, this side song, is has the intention of harming somebody. It's so beautiful to hear. And so everybody, Huti knows what it is. And uh, he warns everybody to stay awake all night. Um, but nevertheless, everybody falls asleep, except for his young son, who is simply, should we say, lured by the song. So he walks out there, and it said he walks into the site, into the power-filled space of the uh, of what is of the site magic, and he drops dead. The site is beautiful. The song is beautiful, but killing. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you will be eager to get back to discuss the ethics in this example, but you need to, to get a few others that I have handpicked for you to get the broad range. Because we leave now uh, um, this family from the Hebrides. No, I also want to say that they were so skilled, both in Seder and Galler, and probably all kinds of other things too, uh, having lived on the Hebrides. So this shows that there is um, there's a connection and both knowledge and uh, training and no, no borders when it comes to magic in the old Norse tradition or the Norse European tradition, in fact, we should say here. Um, next we jump up to uh, Halogaland in, on, in Norway, uh, up on the northwestern shoulder of Norway. And there is a very brief mention of a woman called Turid uh, Sundafiljar. And we can translate that to sound filler or fjord filler. And it is said that simply very shortly that she, she was called that because in a remarkable sight she did, she managed to get the fish back in the fjord, in the sound where they apparently had disappeared from. You can hear parallels here to Thorbjörg's Seder in the, that we heard about in, in the first video. It was also a question of returning food and uh, fertility, fruitfulness to, to the land to re-establish the harmony between nature and the human community. It is not said how she did it, but she also had a son and he was called Völu Stein as a Völve Stein, a, a stone, yeah, and could very well be that they had also worked together. Maybe they were standing out there and just singing or using their staff or both. Um, and I could think of certain gods they could have called, but we could come back to that another time. So this is done uh, on behalf of community. And the community at least rewarded her with, um, with this name, Sundafilia. Then, well, and this story was from Land Namabo, the, the, the Book of Settlements. And then we jump to Njal's saga. And it's also a, one with a lot of drama and conflicts and, and this, that and the other. And in uh, chapter 30, I think, there are um, there are two there are mentioned two brothers who were both very skilled warriors and they also had some of the best weapons that you could uh, you could imagine and one brother of them he was called Halgrim and so his weapon uh, was his spear axe i mean this is a this is a tough weapon. It has a spear in the end, then it has an axe next to it, and often a hook also. It, it can really create some serious damage. Helgrim let uh, do Seda uh, about, you know, with his, about his spear axe, so that that one, the, the Adgeya there, and no other weapon should ever be his bane. That's quite an intent, that's quite a wish. And we could, I, th I would think it was, would be a rather risky wish to send out and to 
to mount to 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 strengthen by the means of uh, of a good sailor. Um, and it is not said uh, the, with the words used if he actually did the seder himself. He could be sitting there with his spear axe right in front of him and calling in. Yeah, you can guess. I, I won't name names here, but but the suitable gods and spirits and powers for this kind of action. Or he could also have asked somebody else to do it. Hired. So so you can see that one can do Seda for yourself. You can also do it uh, on your own, alone, for a customer. And with Kotlisk family, you can see a whole group can do it for a customer um, towards a third uh, party object or, or person. And um, yeah, that was that. Um, that was Halgrim's Atgeja. Then there is a story that's told in two different versions. So I'll just sort of mix them a little bit. In both cases, we, we are in, uh, in Norway and in, um, a, a farmer who has a suitably big house, apparently, is inviting a, 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 a Sami said a uh, cunning or sight knowledgeable woman who has the archetypal name of Heida, uh, which you heard, I think, the first time in Vilusbo. And if you don't know what else to call a Vilva, you can always call her Heida. It also, for me, often indicates that we are talking about more of a mythical or fairy tale type, uh, or because they didn't type of Vilva, or because they didn't know her name. Uh, in the first version of the story, she arrives, Haid, to the farm, to the house, where she has a big following with her of 15 young men and 15 young women, because she wanted there to be big singing. She wouldn't risk to be in the same situation as Thorbjörg was in Erik the Red, where there was only one person left who could sing the song. So, um, and the site was done partly for some kind of community issue, I don't know what. And afterwards, there was, uh, there was a lot of people gathered there. And then she would sit on a tall side hill and would uh, answer questions about the future, would do spa, would do divination or oracular answers for those who stepped forward individually and asked her about it. And this was important. It was, should we say, it was both almost like a, a, a spiritual practice and a magic one at the same time, because people had a different view of what fate was and your own part in that than is mostly used nowadays. But thirdly, it was also entertainment. Um, so a lot of people were gathered there and a lot of people stepped forward to her. And then at one point she says, well, there are a couple of young men over there, men over there, and they haven't asked me even though to me they seem rather interesting. And uh, then one of them, who's also a main character in the saga, yeah, he says, well, I don't do that because I don't think my fate lies under your tongue. And um, well, what would you do? He has clearly said, I do not want you to spoil me. And still she goes on and very detailed tells him how he will move to Iceland. And there's a token there to prove that she was right in this and the other thing. And he gets angry. I can really understand him. But you can imagine from the saga's point of view that then the story in, in during the story we, we hear how he will actually uh, end up in Iceland and will express that she set me uh, truthful words, something, something like that. 
So here we have um, a site where there's one performer, a very professional one, and 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 in this case also it's it's clear that this this class of of site working women, where the Sami people or the Finns as they were called, were having an extra high reputation in in these matters. So they would be traveling. And traveling, indeed, is is a recurring theme in, in today's uh, uh, topic here. I think this should give us your idea how how broad range you have for having an indoor site here, an outdoor one, one built for the occasion, one used in the rooftop of a of a solid house, and and. Others where we don't quite know how it is done, but that one very powerful, well-initiated um, um, side woman, like for example Turia Sundafrila, she could she could by means of this set almost miracles into motion. And I think you also got the impression that you can do it yourself, you can do it together in the group. And it all depends on what the, the, the purpose is, um, and also, of course, if you, if you have a shared interest. So, I could have chosen other stories, and we will get back to some other stories when we have other uh, themes to to dive into. But but there are some that I I do not really use uh, in. Um, you see, there are different bundles of sagas, and some of those who are written when we get further up into medieval age, they get further and further away in centuries from the from the situation they're describing, and so people all and and so the feats that the the site workers could, could uh, accomplish, they get more and more fantastic. And so uh, they may be good stories, but I have concluded that I couldn't really rely on them to tell me something that I, yeah, something usable about the method or the practice of uh, the Sage tradition. And still, they can be good stories if you, if you care for them. Uh, I would also like to mention for you um, a story that has, where it's not said it is Seder, because there are actually other kinds of magic means used, but it's sometimes also used as an argument for how violent Seder can be. And, and it is, it's from the story about Gretia, the strong one. He, he was both strong and pretty wild. And so he ended up getting outlawed. And I think even a, a, douceur, a, a fine was put for anybody who could actually kill him. Um, and he took refuge on a small island. And one of his enemies um, located him there. And he worked together with um, his old she would say foster mother, Turir. She was also called Turir. Um, so he was probably called Tobion. <laughs> and um, she was very well uh, educated and skilled in all kinds of, of magic tradition. So Tobion asked for her help in into uh, getting at hurting, harming, killing, in fact, Gretir. So she went with them down to the beach, and there they found a great big log. And she scraped a surface of it uh, clear or smooth, and then she carved in runes with this intent. Um, she had a plan. Over the runes, she reddened them with her own blood. And then she also uh, sung Ella or chanted uh, Galders over them. And then finally she walked with her shins against the sun around the lock and even walked backwards. 
And th that's the principle using for when you want to undo something. And then they pushed this log into the sea, where it of course sailed straight out to be found by Gretia and one of his companions there. And they took it up to use for firewood. And Gretia swung his axe to split the log and the axe uh, hit his leg instead. And that turned in the end to be into being his bane. You can see there's Galla who's here and runes and the magic principle of, of Widdershins to undo something. It's the like when we I mentioned these galders that were hard spun. And so it's like when you go Widdershins you unspin. And in this case it could be the, the lock of um, of Gretir. Uh, that is unspun, that is undone. And um but no such thing as theta is mentioned. So I, in my way of, of looking at things, I would say this is part of the big repertoire that she has. Probably she did say it in, in another occasion, if that was the best method to use for that purpose. It's always when you can even read all the sources with this in mind, it's the purpose that determines the method and not the other way around unless you only know one method then you have to use that one. So I myself from my angle of working I would not call this theta. I would call it uh, um, skilled, uh, very uh, experienced piece of magic work. Um, yeah, and nevertheless, it has been, uh, I've seen it used as an argument for in the inherent violent character of Seda. And this is why I mean that we, we, we need to be a little skillful when we, when we read the, the saga stories, so we ourselves can make interpretation and conclusions about uh, which, what or the other thing, as we have seen in these examples. Uh, there is a lot about ethics. There are uh, quite a few examples about Seda being used as a weapon over the intention of hurting someone in a conflict. And this has um, led to a rather widespread uh, interpretation from, remember in the, our first video I mentioned uh, uh, Doc Strombeck, that he sta started dividing side up in white and black, where if it was done for divination, it was white, and if it was done for change, it was probably harmful black. And, uh, and so people have thought, and just took that, taken that for granted, that if you do side for change, it must be harmful. So we have to now look at both, uh, two things here, this, the, the situations, the, the times, the countries that these stories came from. And these stories are full of conflict and intrigues and um, people doing their best to harm and humiliate each other. And sometimes they do it with, uh, I mean, they lure each other in, in ambush and whether that is done by magic or weapon, uh, for me, it's not so important. The important thing is the intention to try to harm somebody else. And that's your choice. So for me, I, I divide magic up in these two main categories. A done for divination, for gaining insight into something where, for example, you can foretell the future of uh, any young man, if he wants it. and. Um, and the other is that you are, the principle here, when you do it for change, you have your clearly stated purpose. Let's just say it's this thing of uh, either getting the big guardian spirit of Herring back into this fjord. Then in order to, to, to influence that, you need to gather a lot of power. And that's when you work shamanically connecting with your 
spirit guides or local land spirits or gods um, and ask for for using their power you are sort of the channel for their power and your staff is and that principle when you are then filled with that power then you direct it and that can be done with the help of the staff or the song or just a mighty uh, sending of um, of energy towards that that creature or that thing that your purpose is and that's the same principle whether you want to heal or bless or protect or to harm or to change into something else and it's done it's used also when doing ordinary or other kinds of traditions of for example uh, shamanic healing that you gather some power that's greater than your own and then you use that for healing that patient or that piece of land or that um, that broken project or whatever so there's nothing mysterious in this and it, maybe it's easier to remember if we say that in this case Seda is a, a tool it's more than that but you can see it as a tool or as a, compa a work companion as a knife or as fire the fire or the knife or sight has no ethic in themselves it's me who choose how i want to use the fire or the knife or the sight who has the ethical choice and and that remember that then you can cut through all the crap so to speak in um, and and see that the, all the stories about sight used for in, in conflict as and as a weapon that says more about the saga time and the stories they tell there of conflict and and, and um, enemies than it tells about sailor I think you've learned that now so you can you can you, you can use this knowledge in listening to the last story here uh, and this is about uh, Gunnhild, also sometimes known as Queen Gunnhild. And she will be sort of our bridge between the saga people and, histor and historical people. Uh, because she, uh, she appears in many places, both in saga and history. Um, she was maybe the sister of the Danish uh, King Harald Bluetooth. And so we are talking about we're in the last part of the 900s. And um, she became very, very skilled in magic, all sorts, which we will see. And she was also very involved in politics and in all kinds of political intrigues in that whole Northwestern uh, Atlantic area for, uh, for many years. Now, her education, her magic education, her shamanic education, she partly got in Samiland, where in the, in the, in the saga of Harald Fairhair, I think he's called, um, some people traveling there meet her. And uh, she is there on being educated in, in shamanism and magic by um, two, they must be Sami Noides or Sami shamans of some kind. And she, she says in her own words that I am here to learn that knowledge, that, uh, yeah, the knowledge that I can from these two Finns uh, because they are the cleverest or the wisest in all of Finnmark, in all of Sami land. That's quite a claim. And the word, the words um, used there is, I think, is kunuti from, for conscape, for, for, um, for knowledge. And also that they were the frödister, the, the ones with most frödi in all of Finnmark, magic knowledge. So they did not teach her seder. They taught her 
their uh, different methods and principles and trained her in, in that. And that could be, for example, to use the drum and to use uh, powerful magic singing to change consciousness uh, that is more uh, like the yoik of the Sami land and the Sami people. M more uh, yoik like than kvels or galde like. And teaching her to journey between the worlds and maybe even also teaching her to let part of her, her soul, her hump, um, travel out in another shape, like teaching shape-shifting. After her apprenticeship there, she, um, some part of her life, she lived, she, she got married with King Eric, and for some years they lived in uh, England in what was then called Jorvik, the, the, the Viking um, stronghold there, called York today. And during that time, she became really enemies with Egil um, Skallagrimsson, the known skald, and also the, they, everybody was traveling a lot around. And it was said then that she let Mauna or Efla Seiza, let Du Seiza, um, for this, that Egil Skallagrimsson should not know peace on Iceland until she saw him. Um, today they, they would have used hate speech on, on the social media instead, I guess. But anyway, that's what you could, you could do back then. And so at one point they, they meet Egil Skatlegrimsen, and he comes. In fact, I think he's shipwrecked uh, close to um, where she lives and he's caught, and uh, his life is at stake. And he's sitting there in his cell one night and trying to compose a poem that he can um, deliver the next day and that will probably save his life. But then he keeps being distracted because there is a swallow that keeps flying around him and twittering and twittering and twittering so he can't think. And this is also what Twitter can do to you. And, uh, but his friend runs up on the, um, on the, the roof, on the, sea, on the roof here, yeah, and sees the swallow, but also see how the swallow turns into a hum laper in a, a, a shape shifter running down from, and they think that it is Gunhild who has done that. So um, she, that's a juicy character and very international, as you can, as you can tell. And now you have gotten, um, you can cut through all this thing about, I mean, they were enemies. They did anything they could. I mean, and yeah, to, uh, to harm each other. So this was the last of this handful of very skilled uh, uh, SAID workers. Uh, from uh, Saga and uh, with Gunhild also, well, a few of them, a little bit with one foot in history and the other in the Saga. And uh, that will be the end of them. Now I think we will turn to a few people that we have traces after in the earth, in fact. These were traces in words, now we go to traces in earth. Now let's turn to a few examples, just a brief overview of some of these uh, highly specialized um, site workers and uh, trolldomskundige, uh, shamanically trained uh, um, common folks that has left their marks in graves both in Scandinavia and uh, as we'll see in, in uh, on the Isle of Man. And, uh, the first I'd mention is, is in Denmark, in northern Jutland, is at the place called Fyrkat. It's a big sort of um, fortress, like a uh, Viking building, very, very impressive. And it was built around 980, so something by the King Hal Blotten, Bluetooth. And here is a burial site, and one of the richest graves there is a woman 
who is, should we say, just to, to do it short, she is uh, she's respectfully married in a way that was only for high status women in a, in a wagon um, casket box and which is married, for example, in the Norwegian Oseberg Queen. She was queen, she was also uh, buried that way. But anyway, here, and she has a lot of, of objects and items with her um, that we could well conclude that she is using some kind of magic uh, and, and is traveling and performing her arts and being recognized for that. Even though we are here just in a few, uh, in the New Year's, where King Harald, in fact, has pronounced that he has made Denmark Christian. Still, she has high status. And what we find there is of interest to us is um, uh, an, an iron staff, a short iron staff. And there's also uh, a, a traces of a longer, uh, slender um, wooden staff which for me is, is the most uh, uh, interesting because they are that's more well known to me as a, as a usable side staff and other things. Now one thing that that is up for discussion here is that it seems she also had a leather purse. I mean you can almost imagine that she was the woman that was described as Thorbjörg in Erik the Red Saga. And I'm not the first who's, had, who's gotten that thought. But anyway, you remember that she had a leather bag with all the tofer, everything she needed for her magic art. And so it, by the, uh, the woman uh, in the burial site at Fjordkat were also seeds of henbane, among a lot of other things. And this has made mostly um, some archaeologists very eager to, uh, to come forward with the idea that she used the smoke or something else, um, decoction of henbane that influenced her. It, it's like instead of ayahuasca or everything, a drug to change your state of consciousness. And that's what she was under the influence of such, um, of henbane. Uh, when she was performing her seder. And um, I don't think so, because if we look at it shamanically, historically, then everywhere things like henbane and its, its uh, should we say, its, its kins in the plant family of the strong plants, those that can alter your mind, uh, they, when they do it so strongly as henbane does, then you don't at the same time sit at a side shell and perform in a group of, of people. It could be she has them because she is a kundi and she's also a healer because sometimes it has been used for, what is it called, anesthetic purposes uh, uh, with illness or, or surgery or things like that or to uh, kill your enemies. Anyway, so we, I hope this thing of the henbane, we can, we could maybe go back to that, but it, it's been with the, with, the, with the graves in general, it's often that, and I can say that because uh, my good friend and colleague Maria, he said Jacobsen, who's the manager and behind the camera here, uh, she's also an archaeologist, but at the same time, she's also a shamanically experienced person. And I hope very soon she is ready with a good article about Hengbane and the Fjordcat woman. So we'll once and for all, we'll get that straightened out. Now, uh, but usually sometimes, but that's the Fjordcat woman. What could we else say about her? She has high status. She was rich and the different items in, in, her, in, in her grave. Uh, shown that either she has been very well traveled, at least in the whole Nordic and Baltic area, or she had uh, been trading with people from there. Yeah, if, if you could almost see the story of Thorbjörg retold with a Fjordcat woman in her shoes and maybe happening at, uh, at Fjordcat in, instead, because 
it's said rather uh, many times in the sagas, and that's also what all the graves are showing us, that there was this class or or people were traveling with their skills in magic and shamanism. And it, yeah, in general, people were traveling a lot. So if we jump then from Fjordkat Queen's grave in North Jutland and go to the Isle of Man, right between England and Ireland, there is a burial site with, uh, I mean, that area was much more Christianized at that time. We're talking about the late half of the 10th century. Uh, so in that Christian area is a pagan uh, burial site. And one of them is a woman uh, and her grave and her remains show us that's like the, the richest uh, Viking period uh, female grave outside Scandinavia from, yeah, from that period. She has been called then, that's how you can Google her and everything, as the pagan lady. And, uh, well, anyway, uh, she had with her some, some of the objects in her grave and, and the whole setup of it. it, it had, there are quite some reminders or, or some uh, coincidences between that and the Fjordkat woman's uh, uh, grave objects. And one is uh, uh, a metal uh, cooking or meat spit that um, is lying at her one side, just as it does with the Fjordkat woman. And this has been often interpreted as a staff, as a, a staff for magic purposes. And we can return to that when we get to the video where we will really dive into the staff and how we use a staff. But uh, for now, it's I can say that also here we can see that she was well traveled. As far as I remember, she had like amber beads from the Baltic area and this, that, and the other thing. And it's also then suggested that she was doing magic work or Seder or some such thing. And that could be. Um, but I should also say that sometimes the, I learned from Jonathan my good friend, ex-husband and and part of the firm here that we do together. Uh, when he was an active archaeologist, he used to say that, well, if you find something and you don't know what it is, you can always call it a ritual object. And it seems to me that often when when archaeologists are doing the research here, they, they are they're more eager to read magic into um, whatever is found than, um, than other, the other researchers like re historians of religion. There's also a time thing here because, for example, with the Fjordkat grave, when that was first excavated in the 1950s, I have some of the, um, the, the first reports there and they wouldn't dream back then uh, about suggesting that she was doing sales or, or magic. Rather, it was suggested that since she was so rich and apparently traveling, she was probably a, a lady of of the, the letter of cavalry. I don't know how you say that. Um, somebody is selling her sexual favors. That was the only way you could imagine that she could be rich and, and well-traveled back then. So not a word about magic. So it's also a trend in the time here and, and uh, a fascination. And we will get back to that in, I keep saying we'll get back to that later, but friends, we are moving forward. And we get back to that in the chapter or in the video lecture I call looking the witch in the eye about all our Viking romance and what that does to us in our reading of the sources. Now, anyway, with all respect for the pagan lady, then uh, if we then turn to, just as a, very briefly, in Sweden, in, in should we say, the middle, the, the heart of, of Sweden, uh, there is uh, a Viking settlement or from Viking area called Birka, big one, um, a lot of stuff. And there's also a great burial site there. And several, um, at least some of, I don't know, quite a few of these 
burns, they are also women of high status and with some kind of iron staff or rod with them. Uh, a few places it's clearly to be identified as a, as a meat spit by its shape, but in other examples it's it's like, for example, this long iron rod of either twisted or with a certain handle or such. And it's rather different from the staffs that we have become comfortable with. But we can get back nowadays, or those people I know, but let's get back to them in, in the staff video. And let us just also just mention or remember here that up um, north of Oslo in Norway there is a huge uh, burial of somebody that's been called the Oseberg Queen. Also a woman of that of the high that's the richest one in Scandinavia from that era and a very high status. There is also um, a rather different staff that's uh, in that grave but I mean, what there isn't in that grave is not worth talking about. So, it is for her. It's been suggested that she has been some kind of Gilia, a priestess. Um, but these, these, uh, should we say, these professional uh, specifications might also overlap, being a, a Gilia or doing seder. That's just to hint and. We can discuss that another time. But let's, if, if you now can imagine, just to round this whole off, we've heard about Heilgrens Atgeier and, and Kotkel and Grina in Iceland and fa the family coming from the Hebrides and stuff like that. Can you imagine now, if you see in front of you, a map over all of the Northwest uh, Atlantic area with um, Scandinavia? Uh, in the furthest east and, and then up north you have Iceland, maybe you can almost see Greenland and the British Isles. And then we could plot in all these people we have met today. And if even if you if we now look at just the historical and the grave ones, then you have Birka in Sweden, you have Fjörkat in northern Jutland and you have the Isle of Man. And then you see also connections from the Hebrides to Iceland, from northern Norway via the Sami shamans down to York, and on and on connections. Um, a, a Danish or whatever she was, really were traveling around in the Baltic area and all kinds of other places before she ended her days in northern Jutland in Fjörkett and got her fine burial there. So a network an exchange, a huge, fantastic cultural exchange of magic knowledge, uh, learning and teaching and uh, practicing. And that's, I think, what we take with us from today's lecture.